keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all, and a marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacles have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. May the God of peace, who through the blood of eternal covenant brought back from the dead of Jesus Christ, that great that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers, I urge to, to bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you only a short letter. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Open our eyes, Sovereign Lord, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law for Christ, our Saviour's sake. Amen. True worship, what's that all about? Didn't they truly worship God in the Old Testament? What is it about true worship that we should be concerned about as Christians under the new covenant sealed with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? In Hebrews, in a word, it is out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old covenant sacrifices of animals, for we're told in Hebrews that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats 
to forgive sins. But it's in with the new. It's in with the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary that we might have our sins deeply forgiven and our consciences cleansed. There's something about the new covenant that is far different from what God had ordained to take place under the old. What we're looking at today is the final shot by the writer to the Hebrews to the church, wherever it was, in the first century AD, whenever it was. Jewish Christians in the main, people who attempted to fall back into the Old Testament way of doing things, the Old Covenant, not realising what Jesus Christ had won for them, totally and fully and freely on the cross. And so we look at, sometimes flipping over things rather quickly, (laughs) other times spending a little more time considering True worship. Think about it. Well, firstly then, keep on keeping on. The idea of mutual love, love of others in verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers. The word here is Philadelphia. You've heard of that. It's a, a city both in uh, New Testament times and in America today. Philadelphia love is love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Therefore, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit whom God gives to those who trust in Jesus that they might be able to treat one another the right way which brings honour and glory to God. I see that kind of Philadelphia love being exercised in our church, our congregation. When the church gathers and at other occasions when the church just is sharing in other things, we'll talk about that later on. But mutual love is to be continued. That's what the writer says, just keep doing it. And then there's hospitality in verse 2. Don't forget because... Aren't we prone to forget things? Don't forget hospitality, we could translate it. You might say, well, where does the stranger bit come, come, comes in? Where does that come in? Well, in the early days, of course, uh, Jewish people and Israel of old were expected to entertain train, uh, strangers as they came into the town look after them. They'd come and, you know, ask for lodging and fodder and care overnight, whatever it might be. They'd come to the open uh, city square, the town village area, and it was expected that they would be taken in, looked after. And the same sort of thing then is meant to be carried on in the Christian church. Practice hospitality. It doesn't mean that uh, you will entertain Strangers, absolutely, they might be strangers. They might be people who've become just Christians and yet not known to you in the life of the congregation. You can think about exercising toward them the ministry of encouragement. I see that taking place in the life of the congregation too. You've got the example in Genesis 18 and then chapter 19 of Abraham and the angel visitors that came to both of them, to Lot, to Abraham. And it's interesting that the one that came, one of the strangers that came to Abraham was called the Lord. That probably raises more questions to ask than are settled when we look at that particular event. But there it is. Exercise, don't forget, hospitality in the life of the church. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but just, you know, come over for a cup of coffee, have a chat, we'll pray, share together. God is pleased at things like that. These are all examples, really, of New Testament worship, New Covenant worship. 
the church is involved in these things. Those in prison. In verse 3, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Some good counselling ideas here of trying to imagine the other person, well, the needs they might have and why they are doing or saying the things they do. You put yourself in the other person's shoes, in their moccasins, and you try to understand what's making them tick instead of just, you know, espousing what you think might be right for them to do. And so we have, remember those in prison, as if you were, you know, fellow prisoners, it's a good way to think, isn't it? And those who are mistreated or being tortured, actually, as if you yourselves were suffering. You know what, they were pretty good at doing this anyway, because when you just turn back to chapter 10, 32 to 34, Well, this is what they went through at one time. Chapter 10, verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light? I love that expression. They saw the light. The light of the gospel. And it changed them. When you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering, And it goes on, publicly exposed, there was insult, persecution, you stood side by side with others that were being mistreated, you sympathised with those in prison, that's another good counselling word, you see, sympathy, or empathy even. Joyfully accepting the confiscation of your property. Has that happened to any of us lately because we uh, follow Jesus? It might, you know, it might come to that one day. Because you knew when these things were happening that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions in Christ. Practice hospitality and those in prison. What about marriage? What do we read there? Marriage should be honoured, respected by all and the marriage bed be kept pure, undefiled. They hang on. You know what we're going through today in Australia, in other parts of the world. If there's one area of Christian doctrine or living that is really under the microscope, isn't it marriage? What do we have? The LGBTIQ, and I think it's A at the present time, it might even, this acronym might, might even grow more opposed to a man and a woman coming together in marriage. That's God's idea. That's God's ideal. That's it. His word has been spoken. Back in Genesis 2, 24 and 25, I rejoice in the words. I call it leaving and cleaving. (laughs) For this reason, because man cannot find sexual fulfilment in any other area of creation except in the woman that was made from his side. For this reason a man shall leave, a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave, that's the word, hang on to and never let go his wife. That's what God says in Genesis 2. Leaving father and mother, cleaving to your wife. Good teaching, isn't it? But it's so much being attacked today as it was in those days because what does it say? Marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God, not just Israel Falau, he'll talk about it and others like him who want to uphold biblical teaching, but God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now in uh, the original those words are turned around so that you have fornicators you can work out who they are, you know. Fornicators and adulterers that are defiling the marriage bed will be judged by God. That's what God says. Now what do we do about it? As the church Don't we uphold what God has said? We should. 
the love of money. Luke 12, you know the story of the rich fool. Everything was going well for him. And he said, well, things are going so well, my barns aren't big enough, I'll pull them down and I'll build better ones, bigger and better barns, which he did. And he said, I'm going to leave, just lean back, enjoy life, eat, drink and be merry, you know, because he was just, he couldn't get rid of this love of money. Paul said in uh, the New Testament about love of money, he said it's a fruit of all kinds of evil, you see. Loving it. Can't get enough of it in 1 Timothy 6.10. Anyway, the new barns were built and that night or during the night God said to this man, you fool. Be careful when you call someone a fool because that, 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 that's a heavy word in the Bible. And when God calls someone a fool, it fits. It fits. And he said, your life, God said, your life is required of you tonight. And what about all that you've, learnt, you, you've earned here or that you've worked for? Who's it going to belong to? One thing's for sure, we could say colloquially, it won't be you. Can't take it with you. Then whose will it be, you see? When you follow the God of money, there's a great temptation there. But what's the answer to that moving on? Well, it's contentment. You see, this is true worship. Being content, being content with what you have. If God allows you through prayer, hard work, dedication, honouring him, and things get better for you, we'll praise God for that. But we've got to learn a lesson here that whatever situation we find ourselves in, in life, we've got to learn to be content. Not easy. But that's uh, also true worship. Being content. You know what, I'm surprised sometimes I hear a lot of Christians, say they're moaning and groaning and saying, you know, if, if only. Come on. Come on. Give thanks to God. You see, Paul the Apostle said, we won't look at it, but in uh, hmm, Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he said, I've learnt the secret. And everyone says, what secret? I'm content. I've learned the secret with what I've gone through in life to be content. A lot of people are still looking for the secret. They don't know what the secret is. God will give it to you if you just seek him. In whatever situation or circumstance you're in, you've lost a job, a job will come. But honour God, pray about it. Still thank God for where you are at. It's no accident that you are in the situation you're in right now. It's no accident. God is sovereign. So learn the secret of contentment because Jesus went on in that passage to say, and this is why he could say, I'm content. I've learned the secret. I can do, you know the verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's the answer to contentment. That's it. It's found in Christ. You can do all those things that honours God and please God. You can do them through the, Christ, through the strength Christ supplies. Okay, well, maybe that's a real quick jump through keeping on, keeping on, but it's something that we must keep up doing as a church. And I see glimpses of it happening around me all the time here in Burwood. I am grateful. I give thanks to God. Secondly, remember your leaders. Oh, remember your leaders. Look at the verses there. 7, 8, 17, 18, 19, 24. It's pretty important, isn't it? Remember your leaders. What does verse 7 say? 
Well, before I go on to that, I should just say, which I nearly forgot about, there's a wonderful promise God gives us here about not leaving us alone. It comes across here as, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You say, that's great, that's from the Old Testament. And it's mentioned uh, twice in uh, Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 and 8, you'll find. Same words mentioned twice. A promise, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, said the Lord through Moses to Joshua. Moses was about 120 years old here and you'd probably say it's about time he handed it over to Joshua. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The story's told of a little boy. He was caught out doing wrong by his parents. Won't tell you what he did, but it's enough to know he did wrong. And he came up and he said to his mother and his father, Mummy, Daddy, I'll never, 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 never do that again. And mm, that doesn't sound like my son, they thought, because they knew him to be a bit of an actor. He carried on a bit. He, you know, he just loved acting and he didn't always mean what he said and they thought, well, he doesn't really mean that and they were right. But when you see this verse, my friends, In verse 5, in the original language, there are a number of negatives that are used to bolster the strength of the promise that God undertakes here to care for you. And we can say colloquially, everyday language, it comes out like this, the promise here. In verse 5, for God has said, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. That's the power of the Greek words behind it. Five times over, God has promised that. To you if you trust in Jesus. So why are we doubting? Why are we only going half strength here? We should be flat out, full on, full chat for Jesus. And Jesus isn't joshing. He's not joking. He's not play acting. He means every single word and he's got to say it five times over to get it through our thick skulls. Remember your leaders, back to that. Verse 7, remember your leaders who used to, you know, didn't really preach the word but they just talked about a funny thing happening to them as they were on their way to church and they spoke about that. That was the sermon for the day. You don't remember those sort of leaders. Let go of that. What do I read? Verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. What a calling for men to speak the word of God to you. What a blessing when you sit under the ministry of people who love the word and who proclaim the word of God to you. That's what they should do. I can say from our pastor David and all the way through we preach the word of God here at Burwood Prezi Church and may it long continue. Remember them. At least that, that's a start. Consider the outcome of their life. It's funny, you know, when you think about people who have influenced your life, you can think about them. You don't really say, well, gee, you know, you preached a sermon on John 3.16 or so. It doesn't quite come across like that. What do you remember about people who have helped you in your Christian life? 
you remember the kind of people they were. Because these people here in verse 7 have passed on. It's past tense stuff. Those who spoke the word of God to you. You don't remember particular instances of a red hot sermon from them, necessarily, but they changed your life. Something of God, something of grace, something of faith rubbed off them and went on to you. And you never forgot it. Never forgot it. And you thank God for those people, those leaders. We need more of them. You have them here by the grace of God. By the grace of God. There are churches out there, they don't preach the Bible. They don't read the Bible. What on earth? They're a synagogue of Satan. That's what they are. They're no church of God. So remember your leaders. Thank God for them. Consider the outcome of their way of life. It's the idea of their conduct. How they conduct themselves. Their character. The kind of people they are on the inside. You'll know them. Not Wolves dressed up in sheep's clothing, not false teachers or prophets, but men who taught you, your leaders who taught you the word of God. Remember them. Thank God for them. But it goes on to say, consider the outcome of their way of life, their conduct, their character, and imitate them. And that's not in a, yeah, that's the very best sense of the word. Mimic them. That's the word. Mimic them. Copy them. Imitate them. In the very best sense, that's what it's meant here. Well, it goes on. Verse 8, though. And I'm thankful for what Jocelyn said to the children here. Jesus Christ doesn't change, you know. (laughs) I know the chorus that says, All may change, but Jesus never glory to his name. We taught little children that in beach mission circles many years ago on our beaches. We used to scoop up the kids. We had a sand pulpit. Never called it an altar. A sand pulpit. And we shared the gospel with children and they came to faith in Christ. Wonderful, wonderful things that you can do. Jesus Christ is the same and it just sits in here in the passage between remembering your leaders and don't fall for strange teaching. You know, is it misplaced here? No, it's not really because you need the unchangeable Jesus in a world that is changing all around you to keep stable in your Christian life. You need him. You need him. And the thing is, you can join it, you can say it a number of ways, but Jesus, it's the same Jesus your leaders believed in, though they might be dead in verse 7, when they believed in Jesus, it's the same Jesus they believed in as you, Christians to whom the letter of Hebrews was written, same Jesus that you believed in and the same Jesus that we believe in today. He hasn't changed. And it's the same Jesus that pray God millions will believe in before Jesus returns. The same Jesus. Isn't it wonderful? He changes not. We change, we're fickle. We need him. So that's why that verse is there, I believe. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Got to close? Brother, I'm thinking it's just the providence of God in way, the way that things have worked out today that there is so much truth here We need to keep hearing it next week. Um, Will you please lead us in closing the sermon and then we'll come back next week because I have been... I think this is the way that we we will handle it today. 
That's okay, fine. Yeah, I'll do that. If you want me to return, I shall. I've just got to remember where I'm up to. So let's pray. Father God, you are sovereign. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. So help us to believe in this Jesus of the new covenant that we might know him, love him, serve him and be prepared to die for him, Lord. For he is Lord of all. We thank you for the new covenant sealed in his shed blood. We give you all the praise and all the glory. For Jesus' sake. Amen.